Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thank you for a very kind and generous introduction also. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, um, ben has invited me twice before, uh, and I couldn't come. So this is the third time that he invited me, I, and I knew three strikes and you're out. So I had to say yes, <laughs> and I wanted to come, of course. Uh, it's a great um, honor to be here, really. Um, so today I'm talking about a topic that, has, that is coming forth from uh, the book that Ben just mentioned, uh, Demonic Warfare. And um, I cannot talk about the new research without touching upon the old. Uh, so I'm going to rehash some of it. Um, and one of the things I want to do, that I always do basically, is uh, question categories. And one of, the, question, one of the, the categories that I question is the category of literature. Um, and I, I want to look at it uh, using some new perspectives. So, um, you know, this is the book uh, just mentioned. Um, uh, go buy it in, on Amazon. Uh, even though it's out of stock, they're reprinting it, so you have to wait a little bit. Um, so that book uh, is now two years ago, and the new research is building on it. Uh, it goes beyond it, especially in the sense that what this book talks about is uh, the past. So I talk about that one particular novel, the Feng Shen Yan Yi, uh, that I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, from the Ming Dynasty, basically from a perspective of the Yuan and Ming Dynasty, so that is uh, roughly 13th to 17th centuries. Um, and the new research really is uh, encountering the Feng Shen Yanyi, stories from Feng Shen Yanyi in Chinese villages, particularly in, uh, in Hunan. So uh, Hunan is a province, if you have Hong Kong, then you have uh, Guangdong, and then above that is, is Hunan. So that's the, uh, the province where I go a lot. I have my own bases, so to speak. I have my own base, field work uh, base, a, a, a little village called Yang Yuan Chun. Um, now, before we go into that, I want to ask the question, what is Feng Shen Yanyi? Um, some of you will have read the book. Uh, most of you won't. Uh, you know, it's one of those books. It's published. Uh, we have the earliest extant version from 1620s. Uh, the story is much older. Uh, we have several versions before that that are much shorter. It's written in the vernacular language. It's a story basically about the founding of the Golden Dynasty of China, the Zhou Dynasty, uh, starting roughly uh, in, in uh, 1000 BCE until uh, the third, millenn uh, the third uh, century BCE. And it talks about uh, the struggle by two kings, kings Wen and Wu, against uh, forces of evil. And after they overcome these forces of evil, they can finally establish uh, the dynasty. And the interesting book about this, uh, the interesting thing about this book is that at the end of the book, all the almost 400 characters that have participated in this huge battle, they're all canonized. They all receive an investiture as a god uh, at the end of the book. Uh, hence, you know, the Chinese title, Feng Shen, uh, the canonization of the gods. That's basically a reference to the end of the book, a long list with all the gods. Now, but what is it as an object? So this is the story. How can we define uh, Feng Shen Yanyi? So the generic definition would be to say that it is xiao shuo, uh, you know, however you translate that, that's the Chinese term that is often applied to it, zhang uh, hui xiao shuo, so a chapter, xiao shuo, uh, small discourse, small theories. Uh, it, uh, the problem with Xiao Shuo is that there are so many different Xiao Shuo. There's Tang Dynasty Xiao Shuo, uh, short stories in uh, classical Chinese, uh, and then there's these uh, long vernacular narratives fr from the Ming Dynasty, and there's a lot in between. So as a generic definition, Xiao Shuo is not that helpful. So what is Xiao Shuo? As I just said, it depends on which time, uh, which genre, etc. There are many ways in which you can talk about Xiao Shuo. Um, one suggestion that, of course, talking about the great Ming novels and the Qing uh, novels afterwards has been uh, uh, you know, almost universally accepted is to look at these books, these stories, as if they were literary fiction or, more specifically, novels. I use that word, but I really, I really use it as uh, a way of having something to talk about uh, and something to talk with. Uh, but I don't really like the word novel either. 
Um, my, my biggest problem is that it's a modern definition, and it's entirely secular. So especially when you have a book like Feng Shen Yang, The Canonization of the Gods, where so many of the characters are canonized as gods at the end of the book, and even throughout the story, before they are canonized, they clearly are uh, uh, divine, demonic, uh, not regular persons. So this is the, the, the friction and my challenge, uh, my first challenge to, uh, to uh, the novel or literature, literary fiction. Now, so my solution then, or my approach, uh, is, by, is to ask how to get to Feng Shen Yang, how to arrive at uh, what it might be in more, in more uh, traditional terms. First of all, I look at the context. So a lot of what I do uh, is not going to the library, uh, but going to uh, festivals, going to well, do field work in Hunan. And also, so encounter it in a context, and then encounter the, the content of, these, uh, of the story in that context, but not necessarily inside the book. So you find that the characters that are uh, talked about in the book, written about in the book, they actually act individually as gods uh, in ritual, uh, in these uh, contexts of festivals, uh, rituals, etc. So context and content. Then uh, I look at how, what kind of effect the content has, how it is applied. And there's two more uh, numbers that I have here. Number three, so warfare is one. I don't talk about it today. Uh, that's, that's in my book, and it's something that uh, you cannot really encounter anyway today because in China, um, well, wa wars are not waged nowadays. So the, 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 the thing that is most important for my research now is to look at Feng Shen Yang as a narrative that helps codify rituals, specifically Taoist rituals. Uh, and this is connected to temples, it's connected to uh, ritual practitioners, uh, it's connected to large bodies of texts that are not literary fiction in any sort of way, uh, but ritual manuals. So, um, having said that, I first want to look at the context. Uh, can everyone hear me, by the way? I think I'm in time. Okay. So, looking at the context, I want to start by uh, going back to a time before uh, Feng Shen Yang Yi was established as literary fiction. Um, which happened roughly in the, in the, in the first 20 years uh, of, of the 20th century. So the first history of Chinese literature was written actually not by a Chinese person, but by Her Herbert Giles in 1901, uh, well known in, uh, in sinological spheres as the inventor of Wade Giles, the spelling system. So he says something in this, in this uh, history of Chinese literature, uh, quote, novels and plays are not included by the Chinese in the domain of pure literature. Okay, so novels, and he means books like Feng Shen Yang, uh, are not pure literature. Or, all literature in China is pure. Novels and stories are not classed as literature. So, the question then arises, uh, why, or, and, and, and what is it? Do we have to think that novels are impure? Well, in a way, the, the easy answer is yes. Uh, because they're written in the vernacular and not in classical. And it looks like what he classifies as uh, pure literature, or what he says the Chinese classify as pure literature, is written in classical and not in the vernacular language. Now, another way of looking at it is uh, religious context. So this is Wilhelm Grube, a German uh, scholar, uh, with this nice picture, uh, for eternity photograph with a cigarette in his hand. Um, so he wrote another history of Chinese literature in 1902, one year after Giles, and he says it's a fact that the episodes of Feng Shen Yang Yi nowadays belong entirely to popular religion. Note that he says nowadays, suggesting that long ago they were not. Of course he cannot know, but what he sees is that they belong to popular religion. And he also says it's an extraordinarily important source for popular religion and vulgar Taoism. Well, I'm an extremely vulgar person myself, so vulgar Taoism is just a thing for me. Uh, and that's one of the things we will be exploring uh, today. But I want to start by the popular religious context. So one way you can encounter episodes from this book 
in a popular religious context is by going to temples. So this is in Taiwan, the Bawang Gong in, in Taipei. And you find panels that act out these battle scenes. Uh, and you can see, if I can find the light, here it has these uh, little, so that's this one, uh, magnifier. So it says, Huang Fei Hu Da Zhan Yin Jiao. So Huang Fei Hu, uh, uh, the flying tiger Huang, uh, greatly battles or greatly uh, destroys Injiao. So Injiao is supposedly the son of uh, the, the evil King Zhou, who is actually uh, also trying to. Um, so he, he tries to, he tries to overcome his own father. So that's one uh, scene from Feng Shen Yan on a temple door, and there are many others. Uh, this is one about Deng Zhou Gong, one of the famous sorcerers in the book, uh, Yang Ren, uh, who, who belongs to to the plague department. So this is a department up in heaven that sends out plague if, if needed for punishment of the people. Um, and finally, this one here, uh, Yang Jian, uh, who, uh, who, who collects, who um, overcomes the three oddities, the th the, uh, the, sorry, the seven oddities, the seven strange um, monsters. So these are all scenes, episodes from the book. And you can find them as panels, uh, battle scenes uh, in temples. Now, now we come to vulgar Taoism, my favorite topic. So here a scene from Hunan, central Hunan, uh, basically in the village where I do most of my research. And what you see is a, uh, an altar piece. So this is an altar piece with some uh, divine figures on it. And in front of it, a vulgar Taoist. Uh, he's my good friend. Uh, he, so um, this is a Taoist from a Taoist family in that village. There are several of, of these Taoist families in one particular village, um, about a, th a population of a thousand people, uh, about a hundred Taoists of, of the same kind. So quite a bit. Ten percent is, is Taoist. And what you see is uh, him doing a ritual in front of this altar, and um, you see behind him is here a table with some gods. This is the Cheng Huang, the city god, who is brought in this Taoist ritual to basically pay obeisance, uh, to pay reverence to the Taoist gods on the altarpiece. Um, and that's in itself not what I want to show. What I want to show is here, what you see here. Um, if we go outside, then you find that there are scrolls, eight scrolls above the door of the household where the ritual is held. And it so happens that these scrolls are, again, a scene from Feng Shen Yan, from canonization of the gods. So basically, um, separating the, the sacred space inside and that outside by a story. It, it tells you, uh, you know, now you know, a sacred event is going on, and you can see it by looking at these scrolls. Usually, uh, there's eight scrolls above a ritual space like that. And usually, these scrolls are the eight immortals. Um, many of you will know. So the eight immortals are not uh, to be found here, but always scenes from uh, Feng Shen Yan Yi. So if you look, some, if you look a, a little bit closer, what you see is, for example, here, Li Nezha, the famous uh, Li Nezha, the third crown prince. Uh, you can see that he's a child god. He's wielding a ring and a spear. He looks like a child. He's, uh, his upper body is, is not, is not uh, fully clothed. So this is one of the main figures uh, that somehow this episode is expounding on. If we go on, we find another ritual with another set of scrolls. Uh, and again, it's Feng Shen Yan Yi. And we go see some details. And again, we find Li Nezha, see this child god. Uh, actually, this is the episode, famous episode, translated by Stephen Owen uh, in his anthology of Chinese literature where uh, uh, Li Nezha is born, adopted by a Taoist master, and uh, ultimately made into a Taoist god himself. So um, two sets of scrolls, both hung up outside a Taoist ritual, showing episodes about Li Nezha. Li Nezha, as you may or may not know, himself is a very uh, ambiguous figure. He's, uh, you know, he, he commits suicide in the episode. Uh, by cutting off his own flesh and returning it to his parents as an ultimate act of filial piety. And in doing so, he basically makes himself into uh, a demonic spirit. So uh, he's actually the archetype of a demonic spirit that is then domesticated by Taoism. So you see 
outside, uh, you, you have these scrolls that basically show the story of a, of a demonic spirit who is domesticated by Taoism, separating the outside of, of the secular world from the sacred world of Taoism inside. So that's basically um, indicative of the relationship that local religion has with Taoism. These, um, every every uh, village has its own demonic spirits that are not recognized, that are not canonized, uh, and that then in turn are adopted by the Taoists into their ritual structure, into their, onto their altars, uh, into their rituals. Uh, so what happens to Li Nerta also happens to the gods of the village, is basically uh, the idea. Now, um, another pronouncement from that same time, talking about Shaoshuan religious festivals, um, seeing how not just foreigners, but also the Chinese specialists of, uh, of, of literature uh, see novels at that time. Uh, the people spend millions of yuan per year to welcome the gods in religious Sai festivals. All this wastefulness, upheaval, and expenditure of our country's resources, none other than Shaoshuan are to blame for this. Right, so the novel is blamed for the lack of progress and for all, uh, uh, you know, uh, squandering of money, and that's basically what Liang Qichao has to say. But he, not, nonetheless, he recognizes that you find novels in the context of festivals. There's another one, uh, Xia Zengyou, 1903. He says something interesting. He says the theatrical place for rewarding the gods of those poor regions uh, and backward areas, the book. Books accompanied by the drum in North China, the text sung in Jiangnan, they all belong to the same category as Xiao Shuo. That's a very nice way of saying it, Tong uh, Ke in, chi in Chinese. So uh, the novel, Xiao Shuo, belongs to the same category as theatrical plays for rewarding the gods. So there's always this link pointed out between what we now see as literary fiction and, uh, and um, ritual um, procedures like festivals. So what I wanted to point out here at first simply is to, to say that there's a shared context, the context of Xiao Shuo with religious festivals. Very simple, very straightforward, um, and with things like ritual theater, with the sacred space. You can see it on the walls of the temple, the doors of the temple, uh, but you can also see it as scrolls outside the ritual area where Taoists perform their ritual. So perhaps you know one thing to think about it is that uh, Xiao Shuo could be encountered as a general rule uh, in the periphery of ritual. That's one big question um, that I would like to ask you. Now, we go to uh, number two, uh, ritual content. So from context, we shift to content. And um, I want to highlight one you know, very memorable um, kind of content that you find in, in Feng Shenyang, namely thunder, the gods of thunder, very aggressive, uh, ugly in a way, ugly looking um, gods who are uh, wielding thunder rods and thunder hammers and thunder chisels, etc. So at the end of Feng Shen Yanyi, I'll show some pictures of, uh, of nice looking thunder gods later. At the end of Feng Shen Yanyi, you find one uh, big uh, a list of lists, basically. And this is one list, namely, of the thunder uh, division, the thunder department. Um, which is led by this god, uh, which is so the heavenly worthy of the nine heavens, let's call him like that for now. And he presides over the thunder division with the following names. And, and listen to the order of the names, uh, not for the names themselves, but simply to recognize them when they come back later. So we have Deng, Xin, Zhang, Tao, and then Pang, Liu, Go, Bi. So these are eight. There are many, many more, uh, but to keep it simple, we just uh, keep it at eight. Now, so what you just saw was a list with uh, uh, a heavenly worthy uh, of, of the nine heavens presiding over a thunder division. And you see that depicted. Uh, so this is the particular heavenly worthy here uh, uh, giving you the middle finger. It's actually a, it's a sacred hand gesture. Um, by which he's leading and sending to battle this thunder god. So this is a thunder god with a beak, wings, a hammer, a chisel, and a bird's claws. Also naked upper body. Um, so that's one of the ways in which you can find that relationship depicted in religious iconography. This is a scroll also from a Taoist uh, ritual context. 
uh, you find the same kind of depictions on smaller, um, what are they called, uh, cardboard, well, cardboard boards. It sounds like an uh, excessive way of saying it. But so they put these uh, little boards in, into their, uh, the altarpiece you just saw with these um, uh, the, the golden um, decoration. So this is, again, here a thunder god, and this is the same uh, heavenly worthy, celestial worthy of the nine heavens. So they are often, uh, usually they are put together, and they indicate this, this relationship again of a high Taoist god with a low demonic god that has specific uh, aggressive powers and can help you uh, with specific things that are not so exalted. Um, very consistent way of depicting him, and very often you see also pictures of um, not just a god who, uh, who can deploy these thunder gods, but an actual ritualist. So this is the famous ritualist Sa Shou Jin, who uses this instrument in order to send out uh, a thunder god to beat other demons. So it's often demons fighting demons, and the Taoist has the powers to do that. So that's uh, one of the relationships that you uh, should keep in mind when we talk about, again, vulgar Taoists. So... Um, a very quick glimpse to make sure that we don't miss one of the key points of canonization. Namely, as it happens in the novel, all, all the characters that are uh, participating in the fight, um, and they're often a very questionable background, some of them are quote-unquote good, others are quote-unquote bad, all of them are extremely violent, all of them, or almost all of them, die a violent death. So just like Li Nerta, meaning that they will become demonic creatures. So something has to happen to them. Now, this is from a Taoist manual, and it says the following uh, about this process. It says, as for wild beasts, snakes and dragons, fish and clams, when they are old and of high age, they can also change into human shapes, causing monstrosities and practicing improprieties. Temples are erected for them if they have become very big. Of these spirits without an original name, if they have established merit and cultivate virtue, if they protect the people with blessings, and if the people's hearts turn towards them, then the city god and the earth god may recommend them to the court of the eastern peak. So what you see here is, doesn't matter that they could potentially cause monstrosities and do all kinds of evil stuff. No, as long as they apply their forces for the benefit of the community, of, of the people, they can be... Uh, taken into the, the celestial bureaucracy, in this case the city god and the earth god, recommend them to the god of the eastern peak. And then it, it goes on a little bit. Upon admission, they can supplement the existing incense fires, that's the sacrificial cults, and prosper spirits of an entire region. So they become recognized within that region as, let's say, bona fide gods. As for those of them whose merit and virtue are serious, right, if they really do well, if they really help the people passing examinations and uh, becoming rich, uh, curing diseases, they can be reported to the Jade Emperor's Palace, and they may be augmented with canonical titles. So it doesn't matter that they started out as an animal or as uh, a bad and evil spirit. As long as they do good, they can still become recognized by the higher powers. Now, from that same time uh, of this, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm going a little bit too fast. So this is a text, uh, the, the Black Statues of Fengdu, which is roughly from the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, so the same dynasty from which this novel is. And you see from that same period, that is 300 years, well, two, 200 plus years before the printing of the novel, you see that these same uh, gods that we just found at the end of Feng Shenyang, they are already active as canonized gods within Taoist ritual. So here you find uh, this is a, a rain-making ritual included in a Taoist collection of ritual manuals. And the high god presiding over the ritual is again the, the celestial worthy or celestial venerable of the nine heavens. And again you find Teng, Xin, Zhang, Tao, this time in a different combination, but nonetheless as a quartet. Uh, 200 plus years before the novel was printed. So just to show that you know, these, uh, these configurations of, of gods were already long active as Taoist figures, uh, let's say in, in Chinese society, if you will. 
if you go now, if you go now uh, to Beijing, uh, I highly recommend you make a visit to the Beijing Bainguan, so the uh, the biggest Taoist monastery in uh, uh, in Beijing. And they have uh, a lot of halls with statues, and one of the statues you find is uh, this one. Well, is is this one? So this is the same celestial worthy of the nine heavens, the thunder. Let's call him the th let's call him the thunder uh, god, the high thunder god. And he has at his sides the same gods. Tung. So this is Tung, and this is Xin, uh, and there's two others. I don't think I have the pictures. No, I don't. Uh, at the other side. So the same court at Tung Xin Tang Tao are accompanying him in, inside the temple. And now we go to uh, back to my village or the village where I do uh, research, and you find that uh, in their ritual manuals, uh, this is handwritten, this is from the early uh, Republican period, so roughly, let's say roughly the same time as uh, Liang Qitao, the reformer, whom we just saw quoted, and you see here, for example, one quartet, Ma Zhao, Wen Guan, so these are also famous gods in themselves. Uh, for example, Zhao is, uh, is Zhao Gongming, the, uh, the god of wealth in Feng Shui, Wen is a plague god, God uh, Guan is Guan Yu, uh, Guan Gong, the famous uh, Three Kingdoms hero. And then again we go down, Deng Xin Zhang Tao, and here it is Pang Liu Gou Bi. So again, th the same configurations of ritual actors, uh, you find them uh, in the novel, and you find them in that same village where they use the scrolls of Feng Shen Yan Yi for something. We still don't quite know what it is, um, but I'll be getting there. So this gets us to the last uh, segment of, of today's talk, namely what really uh, is the core of, of my research now. And I have to say that uh, Feng Shen Yanyi uh, plays a role in this, and it's that role that I'm uh, going to talk about now, but it's not really uh, what the research itself is about. So uh, I, 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 my research now is about this ritual codification. How did ritual repertoires in Hunan become a repertoire. Um, how is it possible that you have uh, a small village uh, where you have their own local traditions, which are very different from the, let's call them, national traditions. You find both side by side, and the national traditions are clearly, for a long time already, transmitted within that context without sort of any outside meddling. So that's what, uh, what my research now is really about. And Feng Shen Yang plays a role in this because, as I, uh, as I surmise, it provides a narrative structure for ritual. Um, so I focus on one simple aspect. Uh, in Feng Shen Yang, you have uh, a palace, uh, the Yu Xu Gong, uh, the, the, the palace of jade vacu vacuity or jade emptiness that is situated on uh, Mount Kunlun. And it is in this palace where all the, the good uh, guys, well, they're, they're helped from this palace. They, uh, they give powers, they give weapons, uh, they give all kinds of uh, support. So that's what happens in the novel. And um, it is presided over by a Taoist god called Yuan Shi Tianzun, again a celestial venerable, a celestial worthy, this time celestial worthy of the beginning. And they are called, his, his underlings are called the disciples of Yu Xu, Yu Xu the disciples of Jade Vacuity. This term I've encountered only in two places, namely in uh, Feng Shen Yan Yi and in Yangyuan Village, the, the place where I do my research. So, you find there, first of all, that local Taoist ritual has these scrolls with episodes of Feng Shen Yang. Then you find that the local Taoist temple, now lo no longer existent, uh, no longer uh, extant, but uh, built in 1377, so roughly the same time period when all this ritual uh, uh, became published and printed uh, before the novel, so called Yu Xu Gong. And interestingly, the local Taoists, in their ritual manuals, they refer to themselves as Yu Xu Menxia. So again, the only two places where I found them, uh, and I, I'd be very interested if anyone else has found them anywhere else, uh, so if you do your database you know, that I haven't seen, please do a little search. Um, so only here, Feng Shen Yang and the village of Yang Yuan where the local centers of power are the same, and the people wielding that power are uh, referred to by the same name. 
Now, um, I will give you, this, is, this, this may be slightly boring. Let me do this, uh, if, not that it wasn't boring so far, but uh, uh, let me do this a little bit quicker. I, I'll show you some documents. Uh, this is a document. These are all documents that basically are in the possession of these Taoists. And they uh, provide formats for um, the documents that need to be prepared during Taoist ritual. So in an average Taoist ritual, before the ritual can start, the Taoist masters, they will write by brush uh, dozens of documents that will be uh, offered to the gods, uh, burnt outside also as an offering. And so these are uh, the manuals that contain these models for writing documents. Now, one of these, uh, Oh, and I should say, so these are all the Zhao rituals. So the Zhao is the biggest and most important Taoist ritual uh, that you can do. So this one has an interesting little uh, phrase. It says, Yu Xu Gong Ling Feng Shen Bang. So Yu Xu Gong, in their parlance there, means the local Taoist temple. And it says here, the Yu Xu Gong leads or wields, something like that, the list of Feng Shen, the list of the canonization of the gods. And Feng Shen Bang, it so happens, is also one other name for Feng Shen Yan Yi. So you can refer to it as Feng Shen Yan Yi. You can also say Feng Shen Bang. So whatever we make of this, and I'm not going to make much of it now, clearly there is uh, made a connection in these documents between the local uh, Taoist temple and uh, the Feng Shen Yan Yi. Uh, another one you will find, for example, um, let me stand here. It says... So this, this gives you the, let me stand here actually. It tells you, so today, uh, in the, the Mingguo, so early Republican period, this year, that year, and that day, a uh, month and that day, uh, we respectfully invite uh, of this uh, place, the, the Taoists are here, the Yu Liu, of the Yu Xu Gong, so the Palace of the Jade of Acuity, and another temple, the Tong De Guan, uh, to do all kinds of rituals for us. So here it says in that ritual, when we, do, uh, w when we do a ritual in this village, we invite the Taoists from the Yu Xu Gong. Uh, and um, yet another interesting detail. So there are uh, other references. So this is here one. Um, let me. So here it says uh, for the Ke Chuan, for the transmission of Ke, they uh, rely on this. We don't go into that detail now. Or, and for the, the, the ritual injunctions of the local Taoist ritual, we rely again on the Yushu Gong. So it connects the Yushu Gong, the, the Palace of Jade Vacuity, to the uh, ritual injunctions. And here this one, again, Ling Zhou Shan, we don't go into that one. Here, Ke Chuan, so here it says the, the transmission of Ke, which is a form of Taoist ritual, are again taken from the, the Yushu Men Xia. Right, so all kinds of different ways of saying that the Yushi Gong, and in this case another one, uh, are important for ritual transmission. And that's the, the point that I want to make here, that the Yushi Gong is important for ritual transmission. So, um, let's see, about 15 minutes left. No, 10 minutes left. Okay. Um, so in both Feng Shen Yang and in uh, the Yangyuan village, uh, Yushi Gong is the source of ritual power. And um, it so happens, and now we get to the final point, that all over China, the Yu Gong is not just a simple temple that uh, Taoists may refer to. No, it is the seat of uh, the northern emperor, the dark emperor, who is, it so happens, also called uh, the, magister the magisterial minister of Yushu, of Jade Vacuity, uh, who is the patriarch of the myriad rituals and the chief of the myriad rituals, meaning he oversees all the local rituals. That's the idea. So in that temple of the Yu Gong, we find the northern emperor, the dark emperor, the chief exorcist of, uh, of the Ming dynasty. And he is the one to oversee, to codify, to unite, to bring into uh, line with Taoism all these local odd rituals with their little demons and their, uh, their godlings that uh, have no role to play uh, until they are... Um, until they are canonized. So um, finally then, so finally um, you have at the, so the Taoist movement during the Ming Dynasty 
was basically located on uh, the famous mountain called Long Hu Shan, uh, Dragon, uh, uh, Dragon Tiger Mountain. And it so happens that again during that same time period, the early Ming Dynasty, they instituted an altar called the Ancestral Altar for the Mirrored Rituals. And the specific idea was, at that time, to make sure that all these local rituals could be brought into or could be aligned with the Taoist Patriarchate. Uh, and they used, of course, as you can guess, uh, the Northern Emperor as presiding deity over that altar. So, in other words, to recap, uh, the Taoist movement of the Ming Dynasty basically used these temples of the, the Yuxi Gong and the god that came with it, the Northern Emperor, to codify rituals. And we find the traces of that in, uh, in Yang Yuan Tun, in uh, um, the village that I do research. Um, I think in the interest of time, I, I will uh, skip the last few slides, but let me conclude it in this way. Um, I want to make the argument, again, going back to Feng Shen Yan Yi, uh, and you know, st leaving aside for a moment the ritual transmission, um, I want to make the argument that uh, there are novels like Feng Shen Yang Yi, who all are basically from the same time period, have the same kind of topics, namely battle, uh, magic, uh, uh, demonic, uh, demonic creatures. Um, and these novels are somehow related to ritual, somehow related to um, religion in a broader sense, to temples, to Taoists, to Buddhists. And then there's another generation, uh, and that's where I want to ask uh, a question or set a question mark. A another type of novels that I, I don't talk about, uh, but I do want to mention them to make sure that uh, there's no confusion. Novels like Jin Ping Mei, uh, 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 The Plum in the Golden Vase, novels like Ru Lin Wai Shi, so uh, The Scholars would be the translation, novels like Hong Lo Meng, uh, The Dream uh, of the Golden Chamber, and, and similar novels, these are of a different type. Uh, they don't have connections to ritual, they don't have connections to uh, religious phenomena, uh, and I wouldn't want to, uh, to classify them in the same way that Feng Shen Yang uh, deserves to be classified. The question is how to classify them, because I'm still not happy with the, the secular implications of the term literature, where you have uh, uh, an author sitting in a studio writing a book uh, as if it were fiction and really unconnected to, uh, to well, what people did. And um, to say one last thing, the novels of the earlier generations, so Feng Shen Yang Yi, but also Three Kingdoms, also the Water Margin, uh, Journey to the West, these all have extensive antecedents in theater. Antecedents. The other novels, the other generations, so Jin Ping Mei, Ru Lin Wei, Hong Long Meng, they don't have antecedents in theater, but they produce or they have a lot of uh, uh, offspring in theater uh, that is produced afterwards. So, um, yeah, the, my, my, concluding, my conclusion would be a question, what to do with the difference and how to classify uh, the second generation of, of uh, novels, um, if not through a secular definition. That's what I had to say. Thank you very much. How about I give you the microphone? Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I don't have that much to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, I found that connection very interesting. But wasn't this point made also by, uh, by Karasawa Yasuhiko and Robert Hegel in terms of the communicating vessels of um, legal prose and fiction? Like, I think about Sarcasm in the Docks by Robert Hegel. Have you thought about extending your inquiry into the legal sphere? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, for, for, but uh, thanks for the for the suggestion. But as it is, um, the way that I approach the novel that, I, that I'm trying to get to it is already uh, wide enough and, and broad enough. So this could be a, a separate angle of attack. Uh, but at this point, I think to include it would be too confusing and too um, too ambitious.
could not make the fees for Sierra. Could that be a possibility of the organization if they chose to see something they see something moving forward based on Tessin away from the good existing I think ab absolutely um, the fact that um, society changes during that, roughly during that period, uh, is important. The, the problem is that um, the novels, let's say the earlier type of novels, including Feng Shen Yang Yi, the practices that they represent, they don't seize. Um, and it's not a matter of, see, I go to a village because in cities nowadays you cannot find them anymore. But in cities in the Ming, in Qing, uh, it's very clear from all kinds of sources that these rituals that we now consider to be rural, uh, they were rampant there as well. The neighborhood Taoist, uh, they, he, he would have a very good income because of these things. So in that sense, uh, it's, it's hard to reconcile these, these, two, dif these two different, um, let's say, uh, traditions, the tradition of ritual and uh, the evolving uh, urban tradition. But, but in, in itself, they, yeah, it fits definitely. Uh, I, I have two que questions, uh, just following up your question. Uh, during the Ming Dynasty, or even earlier, how did the Chinese define creativity? <laughs> Is there any possibility that these authors who wrote Feng Shen Yan Yi, they see themselves as messengers instead of authors? Well, that would, that would hark back to, the, to Kong Zi himself, right? Who doesn't uh, invent, but he creates. Um, very certainly, those people who are involved with ritual, which is what I can speak about confidently in terms of what I can see now, is that uh, they, they, would, they would be terrified if anyone accused them of inventing a ritual. So uh, they, f they absolutely emphasize that what they do is transmitting, and they don't add anything of themselves, which is not always quite true. Um, but uh, could the author of Function Yang see himself as transmitting um, you mean as opposed to creating something. I, I think what he s probably saw himself as doing is offering an overarching narrative, um, almost like a Bai Ke Quan Shu kind of thing, sort of an, an encyclopedic narrative to fit in uh, a, a whole bunch of seemingly disparate things, weave them into a repertoire of ritual. So in that sense, uh, what he creates is, is the overarching narrative, um, but the content he doesn't really create. Yeah. So I'm curious about the idea of literary fiction. And so fiction means anything. It means a type of writing. And so what kind of fiction would be non-literary would be a question. I think there are two kind of ideas of fiction that circ circulate in the West. One is lies. It's wrong, you know, made up. The other, however... We hear a lot about that recently. That it has to do with figuration and the work that you do on the material. So for instance, Natalie Zeman Davin's book, The Fiction in the Archives, stuff that we would think of as nonfiction, but it has been processed for, for different uh, purposes. So what kind of, uh, however we want to, well, you also mentioned the 19th figure, Sha Zong Yeo, and by his time, they're cramming everything into fiction, right? It includes Shou Chang Wenxia, it's a oral performance literature and theater as well. But I think that's very specific to the 19th century and not so much before. So anyway, how are you going to categorize this particular type of writing to indicate that it is uh, one tradition, but not one that uh, encompasses all of the Ming novel even, right? Right. Well, well, so let's let's set that clear, right? Let, let's set that straight. That definitely, I, I see them as as two different forms of writing, um, and you know, I say in my book also that the second uh, generation is uh, more in line with modern definitions of uh, of fiction. Um, <clears throat> you know, in general, the term fiction, and, and I try to not speak as a modern, which is impossible, but I try. Um, the term fiction when applied to these earlier novels, in, in that t is, is, um, is inadequate to the extent that... So I'm not forcing you to use fiction. You can use whatever term you want. Oh, then, the then, then, uh, then, what, then maybe I didn't understand your question. Well, uh, I began with saying I have a struggle with the idea of literary fiction because some other kind of fiction is not... Literary. I see, I see, I see, right, right. Uh, 
Um, th this is. Yeah, yeah. I've struggled with that question um, a lot. Um, I've mostly been trying to avoid terms like novel, but I still use it in the book, uh, or fiction. I still I, I use that much less. Um, the term that I've first come up with uh, for my dissertation uh, was religious chronicles, but that's really a terrible term. Um, like everything in a dissertation. Um, one possibility that I'm playing with now, but it's not a good one, you know, novel or fiction is nice and short. Uh, the, the thing that I'm having in my mind now is something like sacred histories or, uh, you know, um, maybe even hagiographies. In, in that sense, similar to the Mahabharata or, uh, or, or perhaps even the, the Odyssey in, in some ways, um, in the encyclopedic approach, you know, weaving so many gods into one big narrative, um, it's not fiction, um, but hagiography wouldn't be too bad. Uh. Yes, please. I, uh, I grew up in Taiwan, and I worship all these gods. I never know what they do <laughs> until, <laughs> until I read your you know, introduction. And I realized that Dong Shen Yuan Yi actually is a resume of all these gods. Okay? And it's a very, it's a inform, uh, it, it reminds me of something that's kind of very interesting that why at this time the people in Ming Dynasty feel the need to write down this informative uh, kind of um, and make it into uh, something interesting that we can read it. And, 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 and thinking about all the other Bai Hua Xiao Shuo, where that a lot of them, they, they just want to make a history or they just want to make, to inform you what exactly happened in this world, uh, the world at that time. And it made me feel like, are uh, those Bai Hua Xiao Shuo actually is a kind of um, renouncing, uh, Wen Hua, Wen Yi Fu Xin for those people who are Han, uh, <laughs> people or thousand people, that they are not Buddhism, they are not Muslim, they are not uh, Confucianism, they are Taoism. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they are live in this real world and they just try to tell you what's like of this world. Right, uh, if, if, if I can take it as a, a, a statement about uh, the nature of, the, of, of these books, I almost said the novel. Um, it seems to be that they uh, they they posit uh, sort of the the the, possi the possibly experienced world of let's say theater, ritual, temple life, festivals, etc. That that you would find specific to well, you say the Han Dynasty, uh, the Han uh, Chinese. Um, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that. But let's say the the Sinophone world. I think that that's fair to say. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was, um, uh, you know, uh, I saw your on one of the, the powerpoints here the you know the literary the, the the literary challenge to or what what was it the challenge of one thing to the other ritual challenge ritual challenge to literature. Um, I I wouldn't view it so much as a challenge to literature. Uh, I think if anything that your presentation showed is that. They, there is a continuous process of cross fertilization between the religious practices and what gets written down, and you, you can't think of one of you know them challenging the other. Um, and the the other thing is that uh, other comment I'd like to make is that even in these. Um, uh, novels, uh, short fictions like uh, Pearl Sewn Shirt, um, uh, Hung Lo Meng, uh, you have things that, or certain episodes that even if you if you trace back to their antecedents, uh, way back to the Han and Six Dynasties, uh, especially uh, courtship scenes, uh, places where um, you know. The a protagonist uh, sets out uh, certain things uh, awaiting his beloved. Um, uh, there's usually the spreading of uh, 
you know, there's incense, there's usually the hanging of, of draperies and things like that. Why? Well, it all goes back to the way in ancient days the, the, um, the shamans would welcome uh, the, the coming of spirits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there is a, a ritual component even to these supposedly secular stories. Um, so anyway, that's my comment. Yeah, thank you. So um, the word literature, of course, can be used in, in, in any number of ways. For example, uh, someone could say, as you can read in the, in the um, psychiatric, psychiatrical literature. So then it's basically a broad designation of texts, uh, and that can be educational um, or something else. So w that's why I clarified literary fiction, so I'm referring to that kind of uh, literature. Um, and I specifically mean, I don't mean to say, so some people have uh, asked me if I mean to say that China has no literary tradition, according to my understanding. And that's not what I mean to say at all. I'm just saying if we look at these texts, uh, can we please forget about our assumptions when we use the term literature uh, and not assume that it is actually a universal category um, um, of, of, of understanding? That's, that's basically all. So that answer your question? Um, enjoy your talk very much and really appreciate all the information you have gathered. Um, I just want to offer a perspective from me as a psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when I listen to it, your um, talk about those early writings, like the, the struggle between the good and the evil, and the evil was the aggression and all those wild energies which are somehow channeled into constructive use to serve the village, to serve humanity, let's mm -hmm. say. That is very much like uh, the stage of human development because we have both sides. Both the good and evil are two sides of the same coin. So. Um, Rituals then serve a very important function. From my standpoint, the ritual would be like a collective super ego, you know, to just channel all the um, untamed thoughts, feelings, wishes into constructive thing. And then when it comes to the second generation of literature, I myself would ask what happened. A human beings develop. Uh, both intellectually, emotionally, collectively, to the point that all the external sort of um, props and assistance tools in terms of taming those impulses, the wildness, are already taken in, we call it internalized, so that the external rituals no longer assume the same kind of importance as the generation before. But I don't know how you could fit that into you know, your categories. Well, thanks for a very uh, insightful remark. Um, I, I must admit that I have a very strong uh, interest, or I, I used to have a very strong interest um, in s specifically the idea you're describing, uh, namely ritual as a way of coming to terms with, uh, uh, let's say, psychological uh, phenomena. and. Um, so it's something that uh, people ha have studied and are studying, um, and I feel at this moment I couldn't contribute too much. But it's one thing that I have to think of when uh, when I was listening to you is that there is uh, again from that same period Freud, I think nineteen maybe nineteen eleven or something, where he wrote uh, Totem and Taboo. Uh, so he has a chapter on the omnipotence of of, uh, of uh, thought uh, and magic, and um, he. You, you, you talk about the development of humanity. He has this scheme where um, uh, he puts the development of a child and a human being on the same level as religions, saying that on the lowest levels, primitive religion, uh, where people mistake outside phenomena for outside phenomena, like gods and demons, but in fact they're projections of their own evil impulses. And then you have religion, uh, which is the, the next step towards you know, monotheism and a more pure religion. And then finally you have science. So uh, it, it, it fits in, in the narrative, and, and I think it's, it's very um, 
yeah, it's interesting to look at. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I. I. I'm qualified to. Uh, to do much with it. Yeah. But what about the whole idea of evolving the evolution you know, from one generation to the next, giving each other perspective on how to do it? Instead of talking about the difference today, we can talk about the evolution. I will take it into account. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. about that day um, well because of like uh, the some people initially called this is Taoism or well, uh, wh what's your perspective about that well, I, I, I couldn't hear the first part I, I, mis I think I, I heard you say something like uh, if, if you were uh, how should we define or how should we just uh, classify okay this should just uh, go to the Taoism and uh, that just uh, go to the Confucianism or whatever I mean just uh, That's probably the most difficult question uh, that I got today, uh, how to classify. Um, basically, there are um, m m there's many different ways of thinking about it. Um, my perspective is, um, first of all, there is Taoist ritual, as you see today, that some people, you know, they call it Tao Jiao as opposed to Tao Jia. So then you have Lao, uh, Lao Zhuang, which uh, supposedly is a different category altogether from Tao Jiao. Um, in fact, in my, in my work, one of the things I'm trying to do is to show that there's a very clear uh, connection between Tao Jia and Tao Jiao. Uh, and, that, and this too, Tao Jia and Tao Jiao, is, uh, um, is a, uh, a, a fiction, is something that is invented during the modernization. Before the modernization, the distinction didn't exist. Um, um, then, you know, how to distinguish it between Confucianism and, and, uh, um, and Taoism or Buddhism. Well, it so happens in these villages, uh, there are different kinds of ritual practiced by different kinds of practitioners. So Buddhists have their traditions, uh, Taoists have their traditions, then there's the local traditions uh, done by Fa Shi or Shi Gong, uh, who are related to Taoism but also to Buddhism, and there's a little bit of shamanic uh, stuff. And uh, there used to be uh, the Li Sheng, the Confucian, uh, the Confucian ritualists, if you like, who no longer exist because there's no more uh, Confucian training, but their rituals have been adopted mostly by Taoists. So when, when they do a funeral, there's still a Confucian element uh, acted out by Taoists, but in the guise of a Confucian. So that, that's how, you know, you, people themselves, they distinct, those who are still involved in uh, the practice of these, of these uh, denominations, they distinguish very rigidly. In, in your field work with the ritual specialists who are engaging in rituals that draw on the function yang yi, I'm curious what role the actual novel plays in that, if at all. Is that a source of knowledge for them, or is that something else? Um, uh, so in some, I've seen one manual uh, where um, it says, for this and this, uh, for an explanation of this and this, Look in l look to function yang yi, so it, it, the the ritual the Taoist ritual manual refers to function yang yi for an explanation, so that's a very very clear yes, um, but aside from that it's not so clear cut. Um, you know there are uh, various uh, local let's say theatrical scripts uh, also orally transmitted where there are links with function yang yi, uh, but not very clear and very murky. Um, um, one thing that I decided to skip today is, uh, you know, to talk about one god called Injiao. I mentioned him in the beginning with the temple panel, Injiao, the, the rebellious son of, uh, of Zhou Wang, who uh, was later made into uh, the embodiment of Tai Sui, the great year Jupiter. So he turns out to be a very important god in, uh, in, uh, in that area. Um, and it turns out that, again, if you, if you read through uh, the ritual manuals, you will always find some uh, brief recaps of his, uh, of his sacred background, and it's 
completely in line with function Yanyi. So is there a direct line? Uh, I, I, I doubt it. Uh, but is there an affinity? Very clearly. Yeah. So we have essentially sagas of the saints <laughs> <laughs> accompanied by um, a, a priesthood. Now the Kohen in the Jewish religion are the priesthood, and they share a, a genetic background. I was wondering to what extent the being a Taoist in a village is hereditary. Um, in principle, it's entirely hereditary. So you would have um, fathers uh, training their sons and grandfathers. Uh, the Cultural Revolution has uh, somewhat interrupted that, so 1960s and early 70s, um, when all these things were forbidden. But they were still done in the dark. You know, in instead of gongs, they would use the, the lids of teacups. Uh, they would close the blinds and the doors, etc. cetera. Um, so these traditions uh, have been going on and not even interrupted by the Cultural Revolution. But nowadays, uh, they cease to be entirely hereditary because only poor people stay in those villages. So, uh, the, so the, the Taoist family that I work with, he, so he has two sons. Uh, one is very small, only three years old, and an older son who is now uh, uh, 12. He f prohibits him from going with him uh, on the ritual uh, practice, wh which is where you get trained to do things. He says, I don't want my son to be a Taoist. He'll be poor. So now they accept the, the even poorer uh, people who still have no other uh, opportunities, and, and they do Taoist ritual now. So it becomes something for the very poorest and no longer hereditary necessarily. Thank you very much.